Hey guys, today we're going to build out this Niagara Fountain system using 100% free assets and along the way we're going to test out the brand new Niagara GPU Ray Trace Collision. Just look at the particles rolling off my player's very shiny head. Let's get to it. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and this is the first standalone Niagara tutorial episode that we're doing in this series. We covered some on Niagara last episode in regard to footsteps, but this is going to be it from the ground up. But it's not just a simple Niagara tutorial because really the showcase today is on Niagara Collision. I want to go through all the different ways to do Niagara Particle Collision today along with the pros and cons of each. And we're going to end on what I think is the ultimate way to do it, which is Niagara GPU Particle Collision Ray Tracing. And this is brand new, it requires DirectX 12 and also a pretty good GPU, so fair warning. But there is still one advantage that I found for sticking with CPU collision in certain situations, because the GPU is limited in how it can communicate back to the CPU. The communication's one directional. And if all of this is completely foreign to you, that's totally fine. This tutorial is going to take it from the ground up in our build. But in order to follow along, you'll need to get some free content off the Unreal Marketplace, specifically two free content packs, the City Park Collection and Niagara Footstep VFX. And if you want to make your fountain look exactly like mine, you'll need to activate the Unreal Engine 5 water plugin and then also download a single material, a Roman wall material, off a of Quixel bridge. And the final thing we'll do in this episode is set up our fountain sounds and we'll integrate that with the blueprint so that based on the number of particles that you put into the blueprint, not only does that control the Niagara effect, but it also controls the volume and the pitch of the sound. And for these sounds, they're also free. You can find them on Zapsplat. And as always, a link to the spreadsheet is in the description below. You'll find links to all of this stuff in the spreadsheet. Here are our key concepts today. Most of these revolve around Niagara collision. So let's dive right into it. Welcome to today's episode, guys. And to start, we're going to drag in our free fountain asset. And we're getting this fountain asset from our city park collection. If you're not sure how to get all this content into your environment, check out episode 13. I go through how to do that. It's about halfway through the episode. But anyway, in our city park folder under meshes and then under park square here, the very first thing is this SM fountain. And that's the asset that we're going to use to build this fountain today. So we could just drag it into the world. And it's a little bit big for the space, so I'm just going to shrink it down to 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. And I'm going to move it up slightly so there's just a few rocks sticking out of it. I think it's kind of a good effect that way, something like that. And the other thing is, this is a pretty plain looking fountain. I kind of wanted another material for it that worked better with the motif of the overall garden. So I found this Roman limestone wall that I think works really well. And if you consult the spreadsheet linked in the description below, if you go to the materials tab, I have the code for this material and you can find it on Quixel Bridge and just download it into your world. So the material I'm switching with is MI Roman limestone wall. And so now to integrate this mesh with the Niagara effects and the sound, we've got to make a blueprint. And the way we make a blueprint is with the mesh highlighted, we can click this tiny little button over here. It looks like a decision tree and we can create a new subclass from the static mesh actor. And I'm just going to change the path of this to be under our blueprints folder environmental. And I'm going to name this simply garden fountain underscore BP. So there we go. We got our garden fountain blueprint. And so next we got to create our first Niagara system this episode. So I'm going to minimize this, come back into our content drawer, navigate over to content here. And last episode, when we were working on footstep effects, we started this Niagara folder. So I'm just going to go right back into that. But now I'm going to create a new folder called environmental effects. And within environmental effects, I'm just going to right click, create another new folder and call this fountain. We'll go into that. And from here, now we're going to create a brand new Niagara system from scratch. So if I right click, I go to Niagara system here. We're going to create a new system from selected emitters. And what this is going to start with logically is a fountain. So we can double click on that. It'll add that. We can also add additional emitters here, but all we need to start is this fountain. So I'll hit finish. And for this, I'm just going to name it garden fountain stream underscore NS for Niagara system. And so now let's get this fountain Niagara system up and running on our blueprint. So if we go back into our blueprint and we can add a Niagara component, Niagara particle system component, and I'll call this Niagara fountain stream underscore NS. And then to assign our Niagara system to this component, it's very simple. So we just come over here and we search for garden fountain stream or whatever you named it. And there we go. It's already pumping out particles. So I'm going to move this up to the very top of the fountain right about there. Oh, I'm going to decrease my camera speed here. So yeah, right about there is good. I'll probably do it a little bit lower, something like that. 
compile save and let's take a look at this so there are our particles and there's our fountain right away we got something up and running but obviously we need to make some updates to the particle system right so let's go into that so i'll open up our garden fountain stream here and there it is very simple starts out with a very basic template i'm just going to pause it here and we already went through a lot of this stuff last episode, so I won't bore you by going through it. So we'll just go through the changes that you need to make to really make this start looking like water. And what I would do is I would open up a comparable system side by side with this one. And so there is a comparable system that we can go by. And if you go under content drawer and back to content, and this is from the surface footstep, the footstep VFX content pack that I talked about in the intro. So if you add that to your project, you go into that and then Niagara FX particle systems and all the way down to the bottom, I'm going to go into this PSN water light surface. If I zoom out a little bit and then I'll see it. And I'm also going to pause this one. And so what we're going to end up doing is we're going to use a lot of the setup that this PEN water waves already has. And in doing a lot of testing, I found that this has the effect that looks the most like water, in my opinion. But if you have other ideas, other sprites that look even more realistic, you know, if it's free content, just let me know and I'll suggest it in the comments below. So this PEN water waves is using a sprite render called M splash refract. And so that's what we're going to use for our garden stream here. So that's the first thing that we'll do. We'll come over to our garden found stream into the sprite render. And instead of the default sprite material, I'll just search for M splash refract underscores in between and save. And let's check this out. So yeah, I could see the particles there, but they are absolutely tiny, right? So let's scale that up a little bit. So I'll go back to our system and then within our system, I'll go to our initialized particle because when the particles are initialized, that's where the size is set. And it's under the sprite attributes here, uniform sprite size minimum and uniform sprite size maximum. Make sure you don't get these two systems mixed up because you could very easily change stuff on the PSN water light surface. So let's set our sprite size minimum to about 20 and our maximum to about 30. So right about there save and we'll test this out again yeah so that's looking a lot better we can see the water particles coming up and now let's scale this up quite a bit let's increase the number of particles so we can go to our spawn rate and instead of 90 let's increase this a lot let's go to like 10,000. save and there we have it now it's starting to look like water right it's starting to look like a real fountain but before we go any further let's turn on our fps let's start looking at this in real time so our fps here i'm looking at about 40 and this is running off of the CPU, so it's going to be more intensive than a GPU particle effect. Let's turn down the spawn rate again to about 100 just to see what the effect is going to be on our FPS. So yeah, so we're looking at 42 to 45. Yeah, so increasing it to 10,000, that really didn't make that much of an impact. Although I have a really good machine, so that might be why. Yeah, so it did have a little bit of an impact, right? I'm noticing like a 1 to 2 FPS. Now, if you increase this up to 100,000, I guarantee you it's going to have a major effect. And let's actually do that just to try it out. Add in another zero. Yeah, so now, yeah, look at my FPS now. So now it's dipping below 30. It's looking really cool, actually. But yeah, that's not going to fly. So let's go back. Let's turn it back to 10,000. So there's a few other things I want to update on this emitter. So under initialize particle, I want to increase the lifetime to about three to four seconds. So we're going to increase this to three to four. And that's going to mean the particles actually have more time to be able to hit the water below. But you see, as it currently stands, it doesn't even look like they're hitting because there is no collision. But before we add collision, let's just update this a little bit more. I kind of want to increase this angle so it lands more on the outside of the fountain. So if you come back into your emitter, so the way we do that is we can go to add velocity here and under add velocity, we've got our cone angle and this is in degrees here. So I'm going to switch this to about 70 degrees. And so you've got your inner angle, which is straight up if it's zero and then your outer angle, which is the maximum angle out. And so what I want to do is I want to hollow out the interior of that angle so that the water shoots out in a U shape. So I'll make the inner cone angle 60 degrees. And so that way it's only going to shoot out in that 10 degree spread between 70 and 60. So you see it there already, but let's check that out. Yeah, so there we go. So that's already looking a lot better. But another thing you could do, and this is really up to you, is you can make the velocity more consistent. And what that'll do is it'll make the stream more consistent. So here's an example of what I mean. So if we change these both to 650, so the minimum maximum are both 650. Let's check that out. Yeah, so basically that just tightens up the stream. And the other thing I want to do is I want to increase the velocity generally just a little bit. And that way it shoots out with a little bit more effect. So I think 800 will be good. Yeah, now we're talking. But there's still a couple of things I want to set up here. So if you go into your water light surface system here, there's a couple of particle update effects here that I really like, which is the sprite size scale. So it slowly increases the sprite size over time. 
and then the color it just fades it out to transparent also across time and so let's copy both of these i'm going to make some updates to them but we'll see the effect that they have so copy and paste that in here so we can right click paste and then we have our scale sprite size i'm just going to move it down a little bit further in the emitter And what you'll see when that's turned on is that the sprites are very small when they're coming out and then they get bigger over time. And instead of the size being 0.25 to start, I'm just going to move that up. We'll make it, let's say like 0.7. I think that's good. And I'll do that for both of the red and the green here. Yeah, that's a little bit better. I think I'm going to decrease the spawn rate just a little bit. It seems a little dense, so let's do 5,000. So if you go back into the water light surface system, they also have this color update here. And so I'm just going to copy that. So copy, we're going to paste that in under particle update. It's going to go all the way to the bottom. I'm just going to move that right above solve forces and velocity. And we'll see what that does as well. What it should do is the color should just lighten over time. And you see a kind of lightening as it gets close to the bottom there. The other thing I like doing is just looking at the effect from far away because you want it to still look good from far away. And to me that looks pretty good. And if you want it to lighten even more down at the bottom, what we can do is we can decrease our lifetime. So I'm going to decrease that to maybe like 3.5 and this to maybe like 2.8. And that's going to lighten it even more because the particles are going to be aged more by the time they come down to the bottom. The last thing I'll do is maybe lighten this a little bit, just a tiny little bit. And so the way I can do that is if I come back into the fountain stream system under scale color, it's scaling the alpha here to fade out basically over time. But I can make this just a little bit lighter by dragging it down. Let's drag it down to like 0.7. Let's try that out. Yeah, I'm liking that better because it just looks a little bit more transparent as it comes out of the fountain. All right, so we got our first system in emitter up and running, but how do we get it generating splash particles all around the fountain? And so I'm going to show you the first way to do collision. And this is with a CPU emitter just like we have here. But I want you to take a look at our frame right here because we're going to end up comparing that before and after because collision inevitably it's intensive because every single particle is checking am I about to hit something. So the first thing we got to do is we got to add a new emitter to our system because we're going to have a second emitter where the particles actually emanate from wherever they hit. And so if you come back into your system, fountain stream system, we can right click add emitter. And for this, it's going to be a directional burst because as each particle is hitting, it's going to emanate a burst at that location. It's not going to be over time, it's just one time boom, directional burst. And this is also going to be the same type of material, so the M splash refract. So I can choose that here. And these individual splashes, they're going to be very quick. So under an initialized particle, we can just change the lifetime here to be about 0.4 seconds to 0.6. And we also got to update our sprite size. So right here we've got random non-uniform, which means that our x and our y could be totally different dimensions. I'm going to keep those in sync, but it's just going to be random uniform. So the minimum will be 10 again and the sprite size max will be 20. Now the last thing is we got to figure out how this splash is actually going to splash. So if we go to add velocity, that's going to determine the angle of the splash. And so really this is going to be a 180 degree angle because it's everything above the surface of the water. It could be anything. So 180. And the inner cone will be 0 because that could still be straight up and splashes can be straight up. And our velocity of the splash is going to be different every single time, but pretty minimal, so 50 to 150. And if we want to see what the second emitter is doing all alone, we can just uncheck the fountain here and then hit play. And we see it splashing, but the problem is right now it's splashing, it's kind of emanating this way. We want it to be straight up. So the way we change that is in the cone axis here. So this has to be 0 0 and z has to be 1, and that's going to be straight up. So now we can test it out. Yeah, that's pretty good. I think I'm actually going to decrease the angle even more. 120. So that's mainly straight up. Yep, a little bit better. So let's turn on our fountain again. And so now, before we do anything else, I want you to note whatever the FPS is here. And by the way, if at any point your fountain stops working just like it does here, you go right back into the blueprint, compile and save, and that should fire it right back up. So our FPS right now, I'm seeing it go from about 39 to 42. So let's keep track of that because now back in our fountain stream, we are going to turn on collision and you're going to see the impact. But in order for this to work, we got to set one other thing. So under properties up here, in order for the first emitter to communicate to the second emitter, you have to have this requires persistent IDs turned on. So make sure that that is turned on for your first emitter. And so now, how do we add collision to the first emitter? It's very simple. Particle update, we're going to add a collision node. Collision. The only thing I'm going to adjust here is we're going to change our restitution to be 0.1 instead of 0.6. This is basically the bounce of the particle. Because it's landing on water, there's not going to be that much bounce to it. So we're going to say 0.1. Now, let's take a look at our FPS. 
look at that dip so it's already down to 2425 but you see our particles now they're accumulating on the edge of the water they're not doing anything yet but they're accumulating because they're bouncing off of the surface and then they're just shrinking off to the edge of the pool until they despawn still a pretty cool looking effect right so let's go back into Niagara and now let's set up the communication between those two emitters. But there's one other thing we could do to improve the performance that I've tried out, which is the max CPU trace length. Because the longer this trace is, the more performance intensive it is because it's checking a further distance to see if there's collision. So I found that by decreasing this to about 100, it improves the performance a little bit. Now, if you decrease it to too small a value, it could miss the collision. The particle could just fall through whatever surface it would hit because it's only doing that every frame. And if the particle's moving too fast, then it's not a sufficient distance where it detects the collision ahead of time. But let's set it to about 100 and see what that does for our FPS. Yeah, so still not great, right? Still stuck at about 25, so we'll come back to that. So in addition to collision, the last thing we gotta do on this first emitter is we have to generate what's called a collision event because the event is what's gonna send the information to our second emitter to actually spawn that directional burst. And so the way we do that is under particle update here, we can search for collision event, generate collision event. And now we are all set to set our second emitter to receive that event. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is under spawn burst instantaneous, I'm gonna switch this to zero because it's not spawning anything unless it receives information from that collision event. So the next thing I need to do is I need to add what's called an event handler to handle that event that's being sent. So we have to go under stage here and add an event handler. So the source of the event to handle, that's gonna be the collision event. And instead of every particle, we gotta switch this to spawn particles. I don't really understand that, but we gotta do it. And now the question is, how many particles do we wanna spawn when it receives an individual collision event? So let's say five particles. Now we set up this emitter to handle the event, but we also need to receive the event. So under event handler here, hit the plus sign and search for receive, and then it's a collision event. The last thing we gotta do to be able to set up these emitters to communicate between each other is we gotta set the emitter state instead of self, which means it's a self-contained system, we gotta set it to system. And same thing over here. And so once we do that, we got everything else. We got our collision that's using ray trace CPU collision. We're generating our collision event. And then over here, we have our event handler that's handling the collision event. It's spawning five particles and our receive collision event. And make sure also for the fountain over here, you've got requires persistent IDs checked. The last thing I did after testing this out is I switched our uniform sprite size min and max to this directional burst to be 50 to 100. And here we go here. So we've got particles being generated after collision, but look at our frame rate. That is atrocious. That is not gonna fly. There is no other way to slice it. Doing collision is super intensive and then passing that data over makes it even more intensive. But what if we could switch this over to GPU based collision? And I wanna talk about the pros and cons with that. So the first thing that you'll see, if you try to go over to your fountain and switch that from CPU SIM to GPU SIM, immediately you're gonna get this warning because the generate collision event cannot use an event write node on GPU SIM. So if we use GPU SIMs, we cannot send data from one node to the other. Now there's actually two separate problems here. There's the collision problem, which is how do we enable collision without the performance hit that you saw? But then there's the communication problem, which is how do we spawn particles where the collisions are actually occurring? And for the second problem, truth be told, unless we have a small number of particles, that's always gonna be really intensive, at least as it currently stands, because that has to be done with a CPU sim. Now in the future, maybe that's gonna change, but the first problem, actually getting realistic collision, we can do that now with a GPU sim. And let me talk about what the limitation used to be. So if I come up here and now we're gonna change this to GPU sim, we're just gonna disregard the collision event. I'm gonna delete this out. And on collision, we have a few different methods of getting collision off of the GPU. Now the traditional approach is this depth buffer approach, which basically reads the screen. It reads what particles are doing on the screen because the CPU is communicating to the GPU what's going on on the screen. And then the GPU can ascertain, okay, is there collision? And that's a simplified way of explaining it. I don't really understand it, but I understand enough that the CPU can communicate to the GPU, but not vice versa. And you see that our collision here is working just fine. So you see the particles kind of bouncing off. Yeah, so all that is working just fine with the depth buffer. But here's the problem with a depth buffer. If the origination point of the particles is hidden, so let's say I take my camera down here, and then suddenly, where's my emitter? 
there is no emitter because according to the GPU, the emitter doesn't even exist because you can't even see it. It's not on the screen. It's only when that emitter is showing on the screen that it actually does something. And so these were some of the inherent limitations of collision in Niagara, but all that's changing now with a brand new option. So in our GPU emitter under collision, instead of depth buffer, we have this new experimental ray traces off the GPU. And this was one of the reasons that Unreal Engine a few years back, they retired Cascade, designed Niagara from the ground up. So you could do stuff like this. If you wanna know more about this GPU ray trace collision, I posted more details, a link in the description description below and feel free to check that out. But I'll show you how to get this set up because there's a lot of things we need to enable in our world to even make this possible. So if I minimize this, the first thing we're going to do is under settings, under project settings, under RHI, we have to make sure that we've got DirectX 12 set up here. If you're not using DirectX 12, this is not going to work. And now the next thing also under project settings, if you search for ray tracing, we've got to enable these two checkboxes here, support hardware ray tracing and ray trace shadows. And when you select this, it's gonna require a restart and it's gonna rebuild shaders and it's gonna take a while. It actually crashed my system a few times as it was rebuilding shaders on my level, but keep restarting and it will eventually load. So with this enabled now, look at my FPS, it's in the 60s. I had no idea that turning on hardware ray tracing would improve my FPS so much. And I think it's because of all the foliage. I think the foliage does much better with hardware ray tracing. Now I do have a beast of a GPU. I have a 3080 Ti, so that might be part of it. But if you have a really good GPU, I definitely suggest turning this on. The only problem I ran into enabling hardware ray tracing was some of my assets here. They have this speckled effect. Let me just go in and show you what's going on. So we got to go into the static mesh and for any assets in your scene that then have the speckling, you have to come down and under the static mesh ray tracing, you have to uncheck the supports ray tracing option. And once you do that, if I go ahead and save that, then it's corrected in your scene and it's working just fine. So I'm just gonna spend some time, all the static mesh assets where that's happening for me, I'm just gonna go into the assets and correct that. So now once we turn that on, I just got to go back into our system, back into the emitter for collision. I'm going to switch this from GPU depth buffer over to GPU ray traces experimental. And the trace provider here, I'm going to switch this to hardware ray tracing and save. Now, if this issue is happening to you, what we got to do is we got to go back into our blueprint and we just got to raise up the location of the emitter relative to everything else. So I'm just going to raise it slightly here so it's not colliding directly with the top of our fountain. Now, the other issue you'll probably run into here and you saw it earlier is related to the fixed bounds on the GPU. So if I zoom in here just a little bit more, a little bit more, yeah, then all the particles disappear. Realistically, that's not going to happen. The fountain is still there. It's just off the screen. So how do we fix that? So if we come back into our Niagara system, the Garden Fountain Stream NS system, what's causing that in the GPU emitter, if I go to properties here, is this fixed bounds because the GPU can only render what's on screen. So we have to tell it how far off the screen to actually look for a Niagara system. And so instead of negative 100 here, I'm just going to crank all of these up to negative 500. And also for our max, I'm going to do the same thing, 500 in the positive direction and save that and then yeah so now it's going to stop rendering actually when i turn my screen enough but if you keep turning you see i i keep seeing it there so i think we're good yeah so 500 should do the trick the only other limitation we have with this gpu emitter is we can't pass our collision data into the second emitter with a collision event there is a way we can pass data in, but it's really performance intensive. Basically, it's exporting particle data to Blueprint with an export particle data to Blueprint node. Uh, but I tried this out, and with the number of particles that were spawning, it's the same problem. It's just so performance intensive. And we'll definitely cover that in a future episode because I have a specific use in mind. So as best as I can tell for this realistic fountain simulation, we can't simulate these directional bursts where the water particles land off of the original particles, meaning we have to fake it somehow. Because this is a completely enclosed system, meaning the fountain just runs and runs and runs, we know the general area that those particles are going to spawn in. So we could fake it, right? We could simulate all these directional bursts upward because that's where realistically the particles down are going to land. Now, the only problem is if we really study it closely, the particles landing are not going to always match the directional bursts upward. But for this fountain example, because there's so many water particles in such a small area, realistically, I don't think the player is going to notice that. So I'm just going to fake it and the performance is going to be just fine because we're just going to use two GPU emitters. So the way we're going to do this is instead of a second emitter here, so I'm just going to deactivate this. We can always come back to it in the future and that's why I like deactivating instead of just deleting. So we'll deactivate that. 
And if I go back to my content drawer, we're going to duplicate our garden fountain stream NS system. And the reason we're duplicating this is because we're going to end up having two systems that are attached to the same blueprint in our fountain. So I'll right click and I'll duplicate. And this is going to be our garden fountain splashes NS. And then I can go into that. And I'm just going to close out of the water light surface because we're not going to need that anymore. And then for this one, the garden fountain splash system. So I think I'm going to delete out the directional burst because we're going to keep that over here just in case we need to reference it. So I'll delete that emitter and we're just going to change this and we can rename the emitter. So I'm just going to rename it to fountain splashes. Now I thought about creating a brand new emitter, but it's still actually going to be a fountain. It's just that the fountain where the particles erupt from, it's going to be a pretty wide radius because it's the entire basin of our fountain. And it's kind of hollow in the middle because in the middle, that's where the particles are emanating and going outward. So here are the things we've got to change. So under initialize particle, these particles, because they're just splashes from the first particles, they're only going to last a fraction of the time. So I'm going to make this lifetime min 0.3 to 0.4. And these particles are going to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to make them 30 to 60 because the splashes are going to be kind of a larger size. And then we also need to change the shape because instead of a sphere where the particles are kind of emanating outwards from the middle, it's going to be a disc, kind of a flat disc at the bottom of our fountain. And so under shape primitive here, I can select ring disc and our ring radius. So I tested this out for the size of our fountain. That's going to be about 450. And then this disc coverage. So this is the percentage of the disc that are going to be covered by particles. Now zero is just going to be the outside of the disc. And you kind of see that there in the example. And this varies from zero to one. So one would be the entire disc, but we don't want that, right? Because we still want the interior to not have any particles. So this is actually going to be 0.6. Now the U distribution, do we just want like half a sphere? And that would be 0.5, but we don't need to touch that in this case because we want the particles around the entire thing. Now the velocity of each particle, it's also going to be in a cone because when the splash happens, it's upwards and outwards, right? So the velocity axis is still going to be zero, zero, zero. So that's upward. And our cone angle is going to be about 180 degrees. And the inner is zero because it could just go straight up. But the speed here, it's going to be a lot less because it's not going to splash upward nearly as fast as it came down. It loses inertia in the hit. So it's about 100 to 150. And next, I'm going to remove the collision because it's performance intensive. And for these particles, they're only going to last less than half a second. So we don't need the collision. And then the last thing I'm going to do is under scale color, instead of starting this at about a 0.7 alpha, I'm going to move this up quite a bit. So I'm going to move it up to one. And the reason I'm doing that is because the water is going to be a lot frothier when it hits, right? It kind of churns it up a little bit. So we want that alpha to be high to start. I might even add an additional key here. So if you right click and you say add key, you can actually move that up. And so what that's doing is the Y axis so the axis across is time. So the alpha is going down over the lifespan of the particle. But in this case, it's basically keeping a higher alpha for a short period of time. I also like to make this a curve so I can say auto for a curve. And then we actually have a curve there. And we'll get more into these kinds of graphs in the future, especially when we get into animations, timelines, stuff like that. All right, so now let's get these splash effects up and running. So we'll save this. We'll come back into our blueprint and we're going to add a second Niagara system. So if I search for add Niagara particle system component and this one, I can name garden fountain splashes NS. That's perfect. And when you do that, just make sure garden fountain splashes is over there on the right. And you see right now it's kind of below the water line. So we can move that up a little bit. We can get in really close and just see where that is relative to the water line. So you want it to be right about there. Yeah, maybe even a little bit higher. And so let's test this out, compile and save. So up close, I kind of see the particles dancing there, but not really. And then when I zoom out, I don't see them at all. So what's going on here? So the problem has to do with something called sort priority for translucency. The thing is we have two different materials going on. We have the particles and then we also have this translucent water material. And I tried to figure this out for about an hour and I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized, wait, why don't I just try a different water material and see what the effect is? And I ended up liking that water material a lot more. And that water material is from the water plugin. So I recommend just enabling it and using that one. So we just search for water over here. And if I come down a little bit, there's this water far mesh here. And so I actually like this water even better than the other water. And you could see your particles kind of bouncing there more. Now, the other particles are still colliding and then going off the side. We're going to take care of that in just a moment. But you could see the effect that this has. It's just a lot more prominent. But the other thing I'm going to do is I'm still going to move this up a little bit more. So I get in close. I'm just going to move it, move it up to about here. And now let's take a look. Yeah, so there we go. That's a lot more frothiness right there. And I could also crank up the particle count. 
But before we do that, let's take care of all these particles that are kind of bouncing off a solid surface here, colliding, and then just moving to the side. And the reason that's occurring, if you go back into your original system, your garden fountain stream system, so that's occurring because we still have collision on here. So I do want to keep collision. And the reason is that if we put something into the fountain or if it hits the player, like I really like that effect. But the thing is, if we keep collision as it stands, then we're just going to have all this frothiness go out to the side. So what could we do about that? We could actually decrease the lifespan of our particles. We could just cut this down to like 3.5, but I'd rather show you a better mechanism, I think. So what if we did it based on the number of collisions? So as soon as the particles have collided a certain number of times that they cease to exist, basically we increase their lifespan past the threshold of their lifetime max. And this is a really cool technique that you can use for all sorts of things, but you can update a particle parameter. So basically any one of these, you can update directly in the emitter if something is true. And the way we do that is we do a plus sign here. We could say set and then set new or existing parameter directly. And what are we setting? Well, we're setting the age of the particle. And at first I tried setting the particles normalized age, which is what I usually do in UE4, which is always from zero to one. So if the particle lasts like 15 seconds, that would still be one because it's normalized between zero and one. But for whatever reason that didn't work this time, but advancing the age worked just fine. So we're just gonna stick with that. I think it might be a bug, but if you know more about that, please let me know in the comments below. All right, so we'll take age. We could drag that over to set that parameter. And so what's the criteria by which we're setting our particles age? We only want to set it if what happens, if the particles collided, right? But you heard me say I want a number of collisions to occur because I don't want the particle to just despawn the second it collides. I want the effect of it like running off the player's face. So to start, we need to update this to instead of being a number, it needs to set that number based on a bool. So if I search for bool, make custom float from bool because the bool is what we're evaluating. And what we're going to evaluate is this number of collisions. So if the number of collisions exceeds, let's say five, which is what I tested out, then we'll set the lifespan to be, let's say five seconds, like beyond the lifespan. So instead of a check mark here, I can search for int because we're gonna set it by an int comparison, which is the number of collisions down here. So set bool by int comparison, then I can drag over the number of collisions. And then, so it's saying the comparison type A greater than B. So if the number of collisions is greater than, let's say five. So let's start from the top. We're setting our particles age. We're setting it based on an integer comparison. So if the number of collisions is greater than five, then what is the age gonna be? So I'm gonna set that to five seconds. So beyond the lifespan of the particle, it'll just poof, die. And then the false float, what are we setting that to? I'm gonna set it to the particle's age currently, and that way it's not changing anything. And this is a pretty complicated example, but you can think of all sorts of situations where you might wanna set something. Like you might wanna set the color directly if a collision happens. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drag it up above solve forces and velocity, because I like keeping solve forces and velocity the last thing, but I do want it to be after collision. Save. Let's test this out. So now if we look at our fountain, we just have the splashes. If I get in really close, I can kind of see a water effect where it's being pushed out to the side because it is sticking around for those five hits, five collisions, but it's just enough that it looks realistic in my view, but not so much that it looks kind of crazy accumulating at the side of the fountain there. If all of that was way too complicated and you just want a simple solution, what you could do is under initialized particle, you could just set the lifetime to about three seconds for every particle. And that way you could get rid of collision entirely. It's three seconds, it just falls straight through the fountain and then, but I wanted to show you this ability to set particle attributes because I think it's really useful in various situations. All right, so now we're on to the cherries on top. We are going to set up the ability to change the amount of particles that are coming out of our fountain based on a variable that we set on our blueprint. And we did the same kind of thing last episode with our Niagara footstep effects, but let's go back into our systems and we're gonna create a new user exposed parameter because these are the parameters that blueprints themselves can set in the Niagara system. And we just hit plus sign, make new, and if you go under common, it's an int 32. And we're gonna title this number of particles and come over to your second system. We're gonna do the same exact thing, number of particles. Now, how do we connect our user exposed parameter to our spawn rate? Well, that's simple. We just click, drag, move it in. And same thing with our second system. So now nothing's spawning because we haven't yet set the variable on our blueprint. So let's create a new variable directly on our blueprint called number of particles per second. And this is also gonna be an integer. So not integer 64, make sure to select this one. And this is going to be instance editable and exposed on spawn. And that way, when we place the fountain into the world, we can choose how many particles per second we want it to spawn. 
and then I'm going to compile and save. We're going to set our number of particles per second to 5,000. And that's just our default value for the fountain. So now how do we connect this variable here to this variable here in both of the systems? So we have to do that on our construction script because this is going to be executed when we actually place the fountain in the world. Now, if you wanted to be able to update this in real time, like as the game is playing, you could do that, but that'd have to be in the event graph. And I thought about this episode doing something with a timeline where we adjusted the number of particles in real time over the course of a timeline but I decided we're not gonna get in the timelines yet because I've got plans for that in future episodes. But if you already know timeline functionality, feel free to try that out. So in our construction script, we're just gonna get a reference to both of these. So I'll get a reference to each, and then from each, we'll set Niagara variable, and it's variable in 32. Make a little bit more space here. So the variable is gonna be, make sure you get this verbatim, because if you spell it wrong, it won't work. Number of particles. And what are we setting this to? Our number of particles per second right here. And then we can copy these two nodes, paste them over here, and connect this up as well. And so now, if everything's right, it should be spawning 5,000 particles per second. But now here's the cool thing. So in the world, if I want to crank this up to, let's say, 30,000, let's look at our frame rate here, first of all. But I'm going to make this 30,000. Boom. And now we have a really intense fountain. And our frame rate is suffering just a little bit from that. Back down to 5,000, back up again. And mainly it's a collision because let's test this out really quick without the collision. So if I go to the fountain stream and then I change under initialized particles to just three seconds and let's turn off the collision temporarily and we can turn off the set particles age temporarily. Just wanna test this out. So if I crank this up now to 30,000 particles, yeah, so our spawn rate is basically the same. It's a little bit slower. So it's mainly the collision that's having the problem. So if you don't have such a good GPU, this is exactly what I would do. And especially if you don't care about the collision. So I just made it back to 5,000 and I will keep our collision set particles age for now. Change our initialized particle to be four seconds. And if I zoom out a little bit, you see the effect kind of change, but it still looks good even far away. And one feature that might be useful to know about is under Sprite Renderer here, you can actually set a camera distance culling. So if we keep this to 1000, for instance, so this is the splashes, save this. So now I don't see the splashes over there. But if I get closer, yeah, now I see them. And then they disappear. So I'm gonna set this to about 10,000. So it's gotta be pretty far away before the splashes cease being seen. But the main fountain, I'm gonna keep that the full distance because, well, I want it to be seen across the level. So now the last thing, which is whipped cream on top of the cherry on top, is let's set up audio for this. And for the audio here, I got the sounds off of Zapsplat. You can find links in the spreadsheet below as with everything else, just go to the sounds tab. And so I'm just gonna navigate over to content drawer, over to my sounds and ambiance, fountain, and just show you what I set up here. So we have two sounds and I just set them up slightly differently. So fountain water one, fountain water two, and what I did is I set up the attenuation to be slightly different for both. So the sound kind of changes with distance. So this is our fountain attenuation one. So it's got an inner radius of 800 because this is basically the radius of the fountain as a whole. And then our fall off distance of about 1500. And I did set it to be spatialized with our typical settings. And then for our fountain attenuation two, basically the same exact settings, except the fall off distance is a little bit further. And what I ended up doing is in the queue itself. So the water two, I ended up making a little bit louder. So 0.5 and fountain water one is 0.4. And so the latter one doesn't fade as quickly. It's got a range of 2000. One last thing here, in your cues, just make sure you set the sounds to loop because if you don't set the sounds to loop, then it's not gonna work properly if you move out of the volume that's gonna play the sounds and then back into it. The other thing I recommend is setting our fountain attenuation directly in the sound cues here. So fountain attenuation one to that and output here, fountain attenuation two. So once you've got all those sound assets set up, you're ready to go. So at this point, we're done with the Niagara system. So I'm gonna close out of these and back in our blueprint here. So just like our first episode on sound in this series, I think it was episode 17, we gotta set up a collision volume such that when you run into that volume, that's when the sound starts being heard. And basically that volume needs to be slightly beyond the range of the loudest sound. So whatever sound is gonna persist the longest, the volume should be beyond that. So we're gonna add a sphere collision. Yeah, sphere collision component. And I'll just call this collision sphere. And I thought about just setting the bounds of the collision sphere directly, like keeping the radius to 32, but I think there's a better way to do it. And this is a good trick to know, generally speaking. So if you go to the construction script, what I recommend is setting the bounds in here, but I recommend setting the bounds of the collision sphere based on the static mesh itself. 
So here's an example of what I mean. If you drag in a reference to our static mesh component, and if we drag out a pin and say get local bounds, what this is doing is it's basically getting the minimum and the maximum dimensions of whatever this static mesh is. So you could use this trick for anything. So basically, if our fountain is this tall and this wide, the minimum would be this and the maximum would be that. So the maximum is a vector because it's in 3D space, but I can just search for length and don't choose the get path length, get the vector length here. And then that converts this into a single number. And so based on that number, we could set the radius of our collision sphere. But I'm just going to multiply this by a factor of, let's say, four, because that's going to make this sphere about four times the size of whatever the asset is. So now we need to get a reference to our collision sphere to set it. And then I can drag off a pin and set sphere radius, if I could spell. There we go. And connect this up and arrange these appropriately. And let's go to our viewport before we compile and just see what that looks like. Compile. There we go. So there's our collision sphere now surrounding this static mesh. And its radius is roughly four times the radius of this mesh. And so now let's add our sounds to the blueprint. So I can just go to add and search for an audio component. And for some reason, it's pulling fountain water one Q automatically. That's fine. And then when I pull in the Q here, because I already attached the attenuation to the Q, you see the inner radius and then you also see the outer radius out here. And we're going to add a second audio component. So I'll right click duplicate and I'll name this fountain water two underscore Q. And I just got to change our Q over here. And there's our second one. It's got the same inner radius, but a slightly different outer radius. And the way you can test this is if you toggle back and forth between the two, you should see the outer radius adjust slightly, but they should still be inside the overall collision sphere. And then we just got to set up our events. So on the collision sphere, I'll scroll down here to on component begin overlap plus. And just like we've done previously, we're going to cast to our third person character because we don't want the sound playing unless the thing that overlaps the sphere is indeed our third person character. And then we could drag in a reference to our first audio component and we could just say play and connect that up. And then the start time here, I'm just going to do a random float in a range and the range I'm just going to say it could be anywhere between, let's say one second and 10 seconds and connect this up. And that's just so that the fountain doesn't start playing in exactly the same way every single time. It's probably unnecessary, but it's just something I always do for ambient audio. And then I could take all this, copy it, paste, and we've got our second one. I've just got to switch out the reference. So I'll drag in a reference Fountain Water 2, connect that up. And the other thing we should do here is if I go back to the collision sphere, I should add in on component end overlap, and then we should stop the sounds. You don't have to do this, but I think it's a good idea. It's just good practice. It's really for performance reasons, but unless you have a ton of sounds playing, it's really not going to matter because the attenuation will stop it from playing way across the map. I could just say stop, drag in a reference to our second and connect up stop again. There we go. Now compile, save. Let's test this out. So there's our particles louder in this ear. And if I run away, it's louder on the left side. Now, if I run away, it diminishes down to almost nothing. If I jump over the flowers, if I jump on top of the flowers, but let's come in this side. Yep, I hear it again. Awesome. Now, we already had a cherry on top and we had whipped cream on top, and now we're going to put icing on the cake. And this is the very last optimization, guys. So if you don't care about this, that's totally fine. But what if we could adjust the pitch and the volume based on the number of particles? Like, what if we could adjust the sound to be different based on the number of particles? So that's what we're going to do to finish out this episode. And this, unless we're updating the number of particles in real time over the course of play, we don't have to do in the event graph. We could do that in the construction script. So after a lot of experimentation, I came up with kind of a crazy formula for this. So if you come up with something better, feel free to post it. So the first thing is we got to take our number of particles per second. We got to translate this into a float, so two float. And from that, I drag out a pin and minus subtract 5,000. The reason I'm doing this is we can get a sense from this. Okay, do we have more than 5,000 particles or less than? Because 5,000 is kind of that baseline that we're sticking with. And so let's say we have 10,000 particles. So then I'm going to divide this, divide by 5,000. And that's going to return two in the case of 10,000 particles. But if we have less than 5,000 particles, then that's going to be less than one. Like 3,000 would be 0.6. I'm going to multiply this effect by 0.2. And that basically cuts it down to a fifth of what it would be. And this is what's going to affect our pitch. So the way we affect our pitch is I'm just going to drag in a reference fountain water one Q, and then we're going to set a pitch multiplier. But I can't hook this up directly because what I'm intending with this is this is going to change a base pitch multiplier. So the base pitch is set to one. So what I'm going to do is right click and do a minus sign subtract. And from that, I'll hook this up to the bottom pin. The top pin is going to be one. 
so the way this will work is let's say I have 2,500 particles per second. So 2,500 minus 5,000 is going to be negative 2,500, right? Divided by 5,000, it's going to be negative 0.5 times 0.2, it's going to be negative 0.25. 1 minus a negative 0.25 is going to be 1.25. So it's going to raise the pitch up 25% in that case, because we want a higher pitch if it's a smaller number of particles. But I did some experimentation with this, and it only sounded good if I raised the pitch. It didn't actually work well if I lowered the pitch. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clamp this. And I'm going to say it's okay to raise the pitch to like 1.2, but we're going to keep the minimum a 1. And that way the pitch will never dip below one. And this way the pitch is only changing if the number of particles dips below the 5,000. And the reason I'm clamping this to 1.2 is that anytime you change the pitch more than 20%, it tends to start sounding a little distorted. So I'll hook this up and I'll connect this up here, but we've also got to do this for fountain water two Q. So I'll drag in a reference to that. We'll do the same kind of thing. Set pitch modifier, connect, 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 and connect this up. Now for the volume, this effect is going to be greater. So we're going to take our node, our 0.2 over here, we're going to drag this out and we're going to multiply it by two because basically I'm doubling the effect. So similar to this situation where we started with one and then we subtracted, but in this case, we want our volume to actually go up with an increase in particles. So in that case, I'm going to start with one and then add. So I'm going to connect this there and then disconnect this pin by holding alt clicking. And then the top pin is going to be one. And again, I'm going to clamp this. So the volume is going to dip to a minimum of 0.3 and a maximum of 1.5. We don't want it too loud. Drag in a reference, set our volume multiplier, connect this up. And then same thing with our second one. So here's our full logic. We get the number of particles per second minus 5,000 divided by 5,000, multiplying by 0.2, subtracting that from one, clamping that so our pitch can only go up. That's our pitch. And then we're taking, make sure you connect from 0.2 over here, multiply that by two, the volume's gonna have twice the effect, and that's gonna be increasing in volume. And then we're clamping that between 0.3 and 1.5. So our volume's never gonna be greater than 150% of the normal or less than 30% of the normal. Compile and save. Here's what it sounds like when I cut the particles in half to 2,500. And here's what it's like when I double the number of particles to 10,000. And the effect just diminishes a little bit slower over time. So I hope you enjoyed our episode today. And in our next episode, we are finally, finally making the transition over to animation. And we needed to do these initial Niagara episodes because our very first animation is not really a full-blown animation, but we're going to turn on Niagara Fluids, which I'm really excited to try out. And we're going to start working with fire. We're going to do something with fire. And I'll leave it at that. So I hope to see you there.